To knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brother, uh, kindness, and to brother, kindness, love. And then he says this, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he says if you lack those things, and you're going to be a uh, uh, short sighted, even to blindness, and you'll forget about the cleansing of your own sin. And that's what happens. We get into this uh, mode of uh, staying away from God, and things begin to happen in our life. So we got to allow the divine power of God that's within us, that lives within us, to uh, guide us and enable us to grow. And he'll give us that. He's given us the ability. He gives us uh, a desire to grow. Now we've got to choose to do those things. Uh, I, I, I want to make something very clear to you. It doesn't really matter how good we are, how moral we are. If we don't receive Jesus Christ into our life as the Lord will say, if you're not born again, you are lost. Amen. Now, if you understand that, say amen. That's what we need. Amen. Now, I want you to look with me in chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 3 and read down to verse 10, the first part of verse 10. By covenants, they will ex export you with deceptive words for a long time. Their judgment has not been out. And their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved no one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example. Now you got its an example. He says to those who afterward would live ungodly and deliver righteous lot. You got a circle, of righteous lot. But I'm going to show you something in a few minutes. Who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked? For that righteous man. Dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the, word, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under judgment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we come before you. Lord, we just uh, uh, humble ourselves before you. Lord, as we read these words, it's very clear what Peter is telling us. But sadly today, Lord, it's a, 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 a subject that very seldom is ever preached in the house of God. So this morning, Lord, as your servant, undertakes this matter, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not up only on me, but upon this congregation, that our ears will be open, and our hearts will be receptive to the things of God. Lord, just speak to our hearts, 
open our minds. And let the convicting power of the Holy Spirit fall upon us. A serious thing, Lord, that we face today. We're living in this time that we just read. Even though it happened in the ancient world, as Peter says, today uh, these same sins are more prevalent than ever before. So Lord, we just pray for mercy, not up only on your people, but upon this earth, upon this world. But again, as John says, we say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray those things and ask those things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, Simon Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has made it very, very plain, very, very clear that God will not and does not ignore sin. I, I, I just can't understand why these false teachers, these sin of the false teachers, uh, tell people that God will not judge sin, but He does. Uh, he will judge the sin of these false teachers, those who have deceived many people. And one day, they all will face God's judgment. It's going to happen, beloved. Again, Peter says in verse 3 that their judgment, these false teachers and those who follow them, has not been idle, and their destruction will not slumber. In other words, what Peter is saying, that even though some believe that God is asleep, they think that for some reason God winks at sin or he turns his head away from sin or he doesn't realize that sin is going on. Well, I mean, he's not asleep. He's not forgotten. His judgment is sure and it is coming. In verse 9, Peter says this, the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So God knows all that, beloved. God is serious. His word is serious uh, about judgment. It's a truth about God that is seldomly preached today. We don't hear that. I, I still remember going to my dad's church as I was working on that. I, I picked up a, on YouTube or one of them, the uh, uh, old regular Baptist church singing and the preaching. And I still go back to hear and hear them old time preachers, them hacking preachers, and they would preach hell so hot, beloved, you could feel the heat. They preached about God's judgment. They preached about sin. But there had been a shift. We don't, we don't hear, hear much about, about hell. hell. We, don't we don't hear about God's judgment, judgment let alone sin. sin. I mean, I mean anything, anything goes, goes, it's accepted, accepted and we accept it. Now, I know we've got to preach the whole counsel of God. We must do that. But today we hear more about God's love than we do about sin. We hear more about His grace, His mercy, than we do about His judgment. And God is love, and we need to know that. His mercy and grace endures forever. That's what the Bible says. And that's a great truth. But if we could just take and conceive within the depths of our heart God's love, His mercy, and His grace, we would want to serve Him the rest of our life. Amen? If we would just grasp the depth of all that. But we don't do that. So we choose on our own way. And we've got to understand God is love. But He's also a God who's holy. He's a God that's just. He's a God that's righteous. And a God who will judge a sinful world. Uh, we sing that. And that's what Simon Peter tells us in these verses before us. That God is going to, uh, is not going to let the sinner, those who reject His Son, Get by with their, their sin. sin. And sadly, that's, that's one truth the world does not want us to know. That's one truth that the world does not want to hear. That's one truth that the false teachers will not proclaim. That God will not allow you to get by with your sin. He doesn't wink at it. He doesn't turn his head from it. It goes in the books. The book. And it's written down. And that's, and that's what, what he does. does. So, so Simon, Simon Peter writes in these verses, verses in verse 4, four he says this, this, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and, and deliver them into the chains of darkness, darkness to, to be reserved for judgment, 
and did not spare the ancient world, but say, no, I want to make people a preacher of righteousness, bring it on in the flood of the world of the ungodly, and turn the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, condemn them to destruction. Uh, God deals with sin, beloved. And Simon Peter brings it to a climax in those verses. He says in verse 9, And to reserve the unjust under the punishment for the day of judgment. And then in verse 10, it comes back to the false teachers. That's God's Word. That's what God's Word says. And if God judged them and their sin in the old world, He's going to judge sin in the world today. We can talk about the Old Testament. A lot of people don't even preach the Old Testament anymore. Uh, they say that's old. We don't need it. We're under the new, under grace. And that's all law. That's not so. It's an example for us, beloved. We see it throughout the Bible. So, having laid all that out, Simon Peter gives us three Old Testament illustrations of God's judgment. And we're going to look at those today. First, in verse 4. He says that God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Now I want you to talk about, look at Jude, Jude chapter, or Jude 6. I say chapter 6 and people look forever. Jude 6. When you get there, say amen. And Jude writes, and the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in the everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Now, uh, you say, well, what a world they're talking about. I'm not going to go into great detail because there's just not a lot that we know uh, about these angels he's talking about. But the Bible does teach us that and there was a rebellion one day in heaven. And, and Lucifer, Satan, the highest angel, ranked angel at that time, uh, did because of pride try to be like God. So God was kicked him out of heaven. And when he kicked him out, he took a multitude of angels with him who are roaming upon this earth today, what we call demons. Uh, that, that's who it is. That's who deals mostly with us. But Peter and Bo, uh, Jude both here are speaking of angels that are chained in the pits of darkness. A special section of hell prepared just for these angels. And they're waiting for final judgment. Now, some believe that this refers back to the Genesis chapter 1 where it says that the sons of God who they, that, that believe this believe that these are angels uh, had uh, uh, relations with human women. When God first uh, formed this earth, when he first made uh, Adam and Eve, and they had uh, children, and from those children, angels that were kicked out of heaven didn't keep their proper domain, but had relations with these women. I personally don't believe that, because the Bible says angels cannot procreate. Okay? Some believe that these angels, sin was committed before Adam and Eve fell. And some even believe it's part of the rebellion. So we really don't know what they did. But the important thing is this. Peter is saying if God judged these angels for whatever sin it was, and he will not spare those who reject his will, so if he punished these angels for whatever sin they did, he will not spare those who reject his will. Do you really believe that God winks at our sin? Just reading that one phrase about the angels that he, he created angels, beloved. And he pitched them into the pits of darkness, chained forever until their day of judgment. He said, what you said, what's their day of judgment? Cast in hell for eternity, forever. You think he's going to win in our sin? He's going to ignore it? Heaven forbid. 
The second example he gives us back in 2 Peter is of the old world. Look in verse 5. But did not spare the ancient world. Now, we know this story. I pray you do. Uh, a lot of times when I uh, heard them old times preachers, them happy preachers, what they would preach was, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And they always say we're living in, that, in those days as it was in the days of Noah. The days before the flood in the book of Genesis. Go over to Genesis chapter 6. That's what he's talking about. Genesis chapter 6. When you get there, say amen. Look in verse 6 and 7. We'll look in verse 5. Now, you, you got well, you, you just, it's a prime example of what we're living. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Uh, they didn't have a good thought. Everything was about evil. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth. And, and it's not the kind of sorrow we have. He sorrowed over it. In other words, it's almost like God's heart was broken. Because he's seen the choices that man made. Beloved, I, I personally believe God weeps when we make a choice that dishonors him and his glory. I mean, he, he sent his son to die for us. And we tread his blood under our feet and never give it a second thought. And he grieved in his heart. So the Lord said this, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast, creepy things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made thee. Boy, that breaks your heart when you read that. Amen. Because of the sinfulness, of the wickedness of man, God sent a flood that covered the whole world. Go to chapter 7. Look over verse 17. Because this, this kind of lays it out. You've seen the new commercial about the Ark of the Covenant. It's a cartoon. They show these giraffe families talking. And the littlest giraffe says, Dad, I want to go see that. He said, son, you don't want to see it. It's not even big enough. Your grandfather couldn't even get in. It's not that big. And he had a picture on the wall showing the ark with the giraffes on it and their all their heads above the ark. And the little boy said, Dad, that's just a picture. You've got to see the real thing. So they show him walking up the ark covered with the dad behind the mother. And then all at once that giraffe, big tall giraffe, the man, the father, sees the real ark and he just falls over and passes out. Because it is huge. They say it takes your breath away when you see it. God built it. Had no one to do it. But back to our text. Chapter uh, 7, verse 17. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the water. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The Alps were covered. The highest mountain in this world was covered. Everything was covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. All that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things, and the bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Beloved, it was gone. Everything was destroyed. Now, 
If God didn't spare that corrupt world, just think about our world today. I want you to hold your place there because we'll come back to that. But back in our third example we have, in 2 Peter, is in verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward live, live ungodly. Boy, you're talking about an example. Here we have it. It shows us that. Go to Jude chapter, or Jude verse 7. There it is. You say amen. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth, here's that word again, as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Here's another story we all know. The cities have gone as deep as possible into sin. Now you got to grasp that. The world had done it. God had destroyed the world and this is after that. These people went right back into it, into a sin. Uh, they were some of the most vilest forms of sexual perversion. Unnatural acts, sex acts. It was sodomy, homosexuality, beast out. Which is all condemned in God's word. Now, the day's society says, well, God's word doesn't really condemn that in the New Testament. It's all in the Old Testament, talking about the law, Leviticus. But I want to show you something if you're willing to. Go to Romans. I didn't give that to you guys. Romans chapter 1. Paul's very specific about this. In chapter 1, in verse 24, listen to what God word says uh, because man professing to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man in other words man began to worship an idol not God but a God that they made in their own mind a God that's just all love, a God that does not judge, a God that's all mercy and all grace. That's what they've made in their minds. A lot of you have that picture of God. Or you have him as an angry father sitting up there just waiting to zap. That's the kind of ideal. That's what Paul says people had done. They had made that kind of image of God in their own mind. So he says in verse 30, 24, Therefore God also gave up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts. He gave it over to them. Listen, you can want something so bad, God just gives it to you. God doesn't fight you. Uh, you say, I want that. I, that's all I want. Uh, my little granddaughter sometimes got something on her mind, and man, she's going to get it one way or the other. Amen. Papa will give it to her. But uh, God's like Papa. He'll give it to you. It may not be the best for you. It may be, and it's not what he wants for you. But he'll turn you over to it. That's what he does. L listen to that. God also gave them up to uncleanness. <laughs> He didn't, he didn't give them up to the church, church to the fact, fact to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Uh, a drunk fits that. A drug addiction fits that. Uh, pornography fits that. If you think you cannot stop it, it's because God's turned you over to it who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. See, that's what false teachers want you to do. They want you to believe the lie instead of the truth. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Watch who you worship. 
Hey, go, 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 for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and reserved and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. You see, you see what, what happens? happens? And they, they don't, don't retain God. God. He goes on and talks. It's, it's because, because they, they, they don't recognize the knowledge, knowledge of God. God. They don't they have the knowledge of God. First Corinthians chapter 6 uh, deals with the same thing. But I love this verse because Paul goes on and says, but in verse six, chapter 6 of First Corinthians, beginning in verse 9, do you not know you there, say amen. That, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's if you practice these things. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Now, sodomites is somebody that allows and participates in homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is the book. And such were you, some of you. Some of you, he says, in the church was doing the same thing. But you were sanctified. You were washed. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Our government has made it a law now that we cannot persuade uh, or talk to a homosexual and tell them that Jesus Christ can turn them from their sin. Guess who, who they are? The Sodomites. The ones that voted that into office, or voted that into the law, fall in that category. You, you realize that, amen? Now, I got off on that. I didn't mean to. You need to understand it. Now, God destroyed these two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. But these same acts are taking place today in our country. In this land that we call our nation, our homeland, our cities, our towns. We have gay day right here in, in Dayton. Our mayor proclaims it. We have gay pride. Everything being promoted in our nation. And if God did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, what makes our nation that thrives in promoting sexual perversion and kills innocent babies think we will be spared? As one preacher said, if God spares America, then he will have to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize. And God does not do that. Amen. Now back in your text. In 2 Peter, look in verse 9 and 10. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. See, God can judge the unjust but he will deliver the God. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. What God has done in the past is what he's saying that he'll do again in the future. You know, there's a saying about us as America that if we don't recognize the history the past, our history, we're doomed to repeat. Well, guess what? It goes the same thing with the Word of God. If we don't look at it and learn from it, beloved, we're going to repeat it and we'll suffer the consequences. But God, uh, as a God of judgment, He's also a God of grace and mercy. And we miss that a lot of times. 
just as he reserved judgment for those who are lost, the, the unrighteous, he reserves the deliverance for those who are saved. Now, I love this. Again, Peter gives us an example. First, we have Noah in verse 5. But save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the God. Now, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 6. I told you to hold on there. Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse 8 and 9. But no, you see, God destroyed everything. Everything on the earth, everything was dead. But no, I love it. Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it goes on and says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. You got to get that. He walked with God. Noah was saved. He was born again. Not because he built the ark that we talk about, but because he believed God, he believed God's word, he believed about the flood, he believed about the judgment, and he placed his faith and trust in God. You got that? Not in the boat, not in the ark, but he put it in God. And for 120 years, he faithfully proclaimed God's word to everyone around him. He was a preacher of righteousness. So it's what he taught. That's what he preached. But just seven people, his wife, his three sons, and their wives were saved. That's all. But he's an example for every born again believer, beloved, living in an ungodly world. And that's what we're living in. But he's an example for us. Rather than letting the world influence him, he remained faithful to the one true God. He didn't see seven people say. But he didn't give up. He just kept preaching the righteousness of God. And then when the floods came, God put him, his family in the ark, and God shut the door. You see, God delivered him. A man who, because of his obedience, led his family into God's kingdom, therefore saving them from God's wrath, from God's judgment. Are you on board today? Boy, are you saved, born again? Is your name written down in the Lamb's book of life? If so, beloved, you are on board. Amen. No witness for 120 years, and only seven were saved. We better get busy. Amen. Preaching to our family, our friends. We need to get on board and get them on board. Hold your place there, because we're going to come back to this in a few minutes. But back in our text in 2 Peter, we're giving our second example. And this one is a hard one. Verse 6. He's talked about, or verse 7. He talked about condemning, uh, uh, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live on God. And deliver, hear that word, deliver righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless days. You first read about Lot in the book of Genesis. It, it, when Abraham, chapter 12, when God called Abraham, Lot was Abraham's nephew. 
So he went with Abraham when God says, leave that place, that ungodliness, and go with Abraham, his own. And he came to Canaan with Abraham. Now, he's mentioned again in Genesis chapter 13 and 14. But unlike Noah, when you read all about Lot, uh, you'd never know he was a saved man until you come here to 2 Peter. And 2 Peter said he was saved, that he was a righteous man. But his soul was tormented because he lived in that ungodly place. You see, Lot's what I call a borderline believer. He's a fence strap. He's a, 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 a safe person that's Walking a tightrope above the fire of hell. He's a backslidden, what the old preachers used to call. We don't hear that term no more. But he's a worldly believer, a borderline believer. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 13. I'm sorry, yeah, 13. Bounced around on this a lot, trying to keep you updated. Chapter 13, look in verse, well, look in verse 10. I got 12, I think, but look at verse 10. Now, they, they, Abraham and Lot herds, they couldn't get together. They, they expanded their herds, so they started a little spatting between them. So Abraham said, we got to split up. They're too much fat. Verse 10, it says, Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So he lifted his eyes and he looked. When you read this story of Lot, you see what John talks about, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Boy, that fits. Lot, that's his life right there. And it starts off with him looking uh, and saw the plain of Jordan. And boy, it looked good to him. <laughs> you know, you sit at your house, you watch TV, some of these old filthy shows that's on there today, you laugh and it looks good, it's fun. But boy, they lead you right down that pathway they want you to go. Uh, before long, we begin to accept some of that stuff you see. And the preacher gets up and say, wait a minute, say, whoa, preacher, you ought not do that, you're judging, so we're not coming there no more. We'll go to the church and don't do that. And that's where we start walking that walk. We get a common borderline. We're straddling the fence. That's what he's doing. Now look at verse 12. Abraham, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plains. See, he lusted at it. He looked at it. The lust of his eyes. He, man, that looks good over there. That's pretty. I think I'll move over that way. See, that's our first start. We start walking like the world instead of like Christ. So he moved that way. Listen to what it says. And pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Uh, he, 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 he's right on the border. He's at borderline now. See, he's right at the outskirts. Uh, we, we cross that line. We straddle the fence. <laughs> and we walk that way. But you see how you walk when you straddle something? You're unstable. You're unsteady. You're going to pitch one way or the other. And the lower lust of the flesh will overcome if you're not careful. So he pitched his tent towards Saul. But I want you to look at that next verse. But the men of Saul were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Uh, just because the show says something about God or Jesus doesn't make it a God the show. Uh, that's what we've based everything on now. If we could hear... Uh, 
Tom, Tom Selleck, Selleck says, says praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Man, we'll watch, watch that every episode. episode. Uh, if we, we see, see Matt Dillon, Dillon praying to the Son, we, we'll watch every episode. You see what I'm saying? We, 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 we take that show, we hear one word, Jesus, or the Bible, or the Lord, or pray, and we think, well, that's a great show. But boy, their language, their lifestyle, what they, they're teaching and showing you is ungodly. God haters is what I call them. That's what it is. Listen to what he says again. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly, no, they weren't just weak, wicked, they were exceedingly wicked. And sinful, listen, against the Lord. They hated God and anything to do with God. Uh, when I talk about homosexuality, people get angry with me because that's against their lifestyle or somebody they know. And so that's against God, beloved. That's against the Lord. You have taken that step. You've not pitched your teeth. You're living it. That's what he's done. Solomon has moved, I, I, Lot has moved in to Sodom. He's on that it, The lifestyle of the world is enticing. So now, to take part of that, he's got to compromise. That's what I said. If I've got to compromise, I'll quit preaching. I'm telling you, that first step, you cannot stop. He cast his eyes. He pitched his teeth. Now he's living in it. You see how it works? And he started, he had to compromise to do those things. Look at chapter 19. You see, he's moved, started, look at 14, 12. Look at 14, 12. Look at 14, 12. They, 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 there was a war, a king went in and raided Sodom. And uh, Abraham went back and got his goods back. Uh, but look what happened. The reason Abraham raided that uh, camp, the king's camp, after they had raided Solomon, this is why. Uh, verse 12. They also took Lot, Abram's brother, brother's son who dwelt in Solomon, Sodom, and his goods and departed. You see, he started looking, and now he's living in it. He's become a citizen. Of that city. He, he, he looked, he pitched his tent, he started moving closer and closer until now he's a citizen of that place. Go to chapter 19. First verse. This shows you how far he's moved up in the city. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now, he's really moved in. His, he's a high muckety muck in that town now. That's why he's sitting at the gate. That's where the big shots sit. Uh, he's a leader. In verse 9, he insinuates that he's a judge. Boy, you're talking about compromising everything he had to do to get in that position. But you've got to keep in mind, he's saved. He's a believer. He's living in a city where men are exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. But that's where he's living. Remember what Peter called him and said about him? I'll refresh your memory. He said he was oppressed by their filthy conduct and dwelling among them his righteous soul was tormented from day to day. That torment is the same word used in Revelation 20.10 describing the devil who was tormented in the lake of hell. In the lake of fire. Hell. The devil was tormented. Lot's soul was tormented living inside. Why did he live there? Why did he stay there? Lust of the flesh, lust of eyes, and the pride of life. It's a dangerous thing, love. Uh, I've been
been trying to get everybody to see that, to understand that it's not something you play footsies with. It's not okay. It's not just a trend. It's a lifestyle. And it's a destructive lifestyle. So Peter says that Lot, a saved man, was living a compromised life, a borderline life, a worldly life. He was backslidden, was living, now listen to this, he was living literally hell on earth. People say, I don't have to go to hell. I'm living hell on earth. That's because you're a compromised believer. You're, you're living a light, worldly lifestyle. If you think this life is hell, that's exactly what you're doing. That's the reason your soul is tormented. That's the reason there's no joy in your life. That's the reason there's no victory. That's what he said. Righteous soul is tormented. He was living hell on earth. One other thing, you read about the life of Lot, you he never, never see anywhere where it said he witnessed the people about the Lord. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. 120 years. Lot never did. Don't even see nothing about it. Now, while all this was going on, and Lot's living in Sodom, some angels and the Lord Jesus Christ came to visit Abraham. And while they're there, they have a discussion. Go to chapter 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very great, I will go down now and see whether they have done Altogether, according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Now, God already, he knows what was going on. He just let Abraham what I want to do. Now, look what he says in verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. That man is angels, the two angels. And said, would you also, and Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city, would you destroy the place uh, and not spare him for the 50 righteous that were near him? And God says, far be it from me. I won't destroy the righteous with the wicked. If there are 50 righteous in there, I won't destroy that city. That's God's grace and mercy. But Abraham goes on and tries to bargain with God. In verse 32, this is where he comes to the end. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. What if there are ten righteous men, righteous people? And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he has finished speaking with Abraham. In other words, he said, that's enough. He left. And Abraham went about his place. Now, here's the sad part. Look at 19, verse 12. These angels went in. These men tried to have a relationship with these two angels. Now these angels was men. And these men tried to have, matter of fact, they tried to turn down Lot's door. And the angels just struck them blind. Now in verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, talking about the angels, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, circle that your son your daughters, and whomever you have in the city. He said, son-in-law, so there's another. Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy them. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law. He got that? He read that. Who had married his daughters. 
Now, how many was it? There's at least two daughters, right? Because it's more than one. So at least two. Two son-in-laws, right? Y'all agree? Say amen. That's four, right? Got that? Okay. Get up out of this place for the Lord will destroy his city. But his son-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. And when, and when the morning, morning dawned, dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife, that's enough, and, and your two daughters, who are here, here lest you be consumed, consumed in the punishment of the city. Of the city. Those, Those two, two daughters are virgins, so they've they not been married. So that's well, two, at least two daughters who's married, so that's four. Two daughters who are single is six. Lot and his wife is eight, and he even said sons. Did he have a son? Or was that the son of us? So it could have been up at least to ten people, beloved. At least ten. And God said if there was ten righteous people, he would not destroy that city. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and two daughters every year, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lived, boy, that's the thing you got to, the men took hold of his, you see what kind of, God says, I'm going to destroy this city, but Lot, you got to get out of here. And he lived, he stayed. He didn't want to leave that lifestyle. That's the reason Paul says some of us are going to get snatched out of us and we, our garments are going to smell like we've been in hell. Because that's how close we've come. That's how much we love this world. Oh, what an example for us. Amen? Rick's killing himself back there. And while he lingered, the man took hold of his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Verse 26. But his wife looked back behind him and became a pillar of salt. She's preserved, didn't she? <laughs> preserved unto just. <laughs> so we had three to escape. Not four. Not eight. Not ten. But three. Now watch this. Get a hold of this. You don't hear nothing else. If you're safe, you're living that kind of life. A border. Blind life, a worldly compromise of life, God will spare you. You have your ticket to heaven. But you may be leading your family straight to hell. You got that? You got, you got your ticket. But your family may be going straight to hell because of your lifestyle. What you do. Lot was saved. He went to heaven, but lost most of his family because he looked to the world and not to God. He looked to the world things, the compromised life rather than God's word. For his pleasure was more important than his family. Well, we got a great responsibility. And you're not going to get to heaven and say, Lord, I, I didn't know. You're giving that authority. You're giving that responsibility. We've got young kids here that we need to teach the Word of God. But we need help doing that. We need nursery workers. We need workers to, to do them young kids. You may not have no grandkids at home. You may not have no kids. But you've got to hear your church body. You need to help all you can to lead them to Christ. They need to be living in a home that's a worldly home, a compromising home. And you're the only 
hope that they might have to bring them to Jesus Christ. God did not judge Sodom Sodom until Lot and his two saved daughters got out. And I believe that God's word teaches that he'll not send his wrath upon this world until he takes his own people out to heaven. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Uh, beloved, we do if we're saved. Our world today is not only like the days of Noah, but it's also like the days of Lot. And we are living in that day. Again, listen to what Peter said. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to heaven and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, and turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward lived ungodly, and to reserve the unjust until punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise authority. One day the fire is going to fall. One day the rain is going to come. Are you going to Are you ready? Are you prepared for that day? And if you are, and you're saved, born again, and you've got your ticket to heaven, you need to look at your life. You need to look at your family. Because I don't have a You need to look at your friend. You got family. And they looking at you. They watching you. Every day. Every step of the way. And what do they see? A compromising, worldly, backslidden child of God that's not growing in their faith, that's not adding to their faith, virtue, knowledge, godliness. Love kindness. Are you living what God's called you to live? Be an example. Show them. We have examples there of destruction. But we also have that example of deliverance. Knowing the whole family got on board. Is your family on board? You've got to get busy. Because we don't know the day nor the hour. But when that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ is going to rise first. And those of us that remain are called together in the clouds. And then it's going to be too late. Now we Our Father, we just bring this message to you, Lord, at your word. But your truth, it's hard. Our hearts are heavy. Uh, we're, we're tormented by seeing this world, the things of this world. How the church has compromised the Word of God, and just doing things their way for their pleasure. And their will. Lord, have mercy upon us. Anyone here today, Lord, that maybe uh, their lifestyle fits lives, and I pray for them. I pray for the victory power of the Holy Spirit upon them. I pray for those, Lord, that live like no uh, man of righteousness who preaches righteousness. Uh, I pray for them. Strength for them. I pray for your courage for them. I pray, Father, for your hand to be upon them. Sometimes we, we look at the world and things around us. We look at our kids, our grandkids, and our hearts get tormented by seeing what they, the way they live. But Lord, let us be that righteousness before you. Let them see us and see Jesus Christ in their life. 
Let, Let them come, come one day, day to us and say, what you have, have Papa, Papa, what, what you, you have, have Dad, I want. So, so I, I pray, Lord, for your courage and strength for us. But I pray, too, for your mercy and grace upon us. And I pray, Lord, you just speak to people's hearts as only you can. Lord, so many people was destroyed in this world because of their life they live. They rejected Jesus Christ. Anyone here today, Lord, that does not know them, does not have a personal relationship, their name is not written down on the last book of life, I pray for the living power of the Holy Spirit right where they sit. Just deal with them, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Three of nine.